Company Siegel Theater Center, the Graded Center, CUNY, Midtown Manhattan. Sorry about um, the delay. Um, uh, as always with technology, uh, it's also uh, not uh, unfailable uh, as we humans are. And uh, and so we uh, fixed it. See, I did great fast work at HowlRound and we are thankful for them to, to host us. It's a colder day today here in Manhattan. Yeah, as always a, with technology. Uh, yeah, moist also, air, uh, almost like not as we said, uh, the weather where you don't know if it's going to rain for the next couple of days or maybe it will clear up in the afternoon and uh, we will have um, sunshine. All of it looks a little bit better. Um, President Biden's work to uh, get the vaccinations done so fast uh, is uh, truly impressive. And there are announcements that perhaps July 4th, lots of restrictions will be lifted here in the city of New York. What it really means uh, for performing arts, for opening, uh, we do not know. Most theaters cannot operate at 20, 30 or 50 percent levels. And um, we still um, have to think clearly and uh, uh, deeply about what uh, to do. Also, what did we learn from this? Um, what uh, did this time of Corona um, uh, provoke uh, as, a, uh, as an existential and serious um, 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 engagement with the meaning of art? Why we do that? And because we were not able to do it right now. And uh, now we are. Artists have been always on the right side of history on that complex struggle for democracy and for freedom and for rights and uh, and, um, and they are the ones I think um, we have to listen to and um, it's of uh, utmost importance. Today with us, we have one of those artists who make New York, uh, New York uh, is Chris Myers. Chris, thanks uh, for, for being with us. Thank you for having me, happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry for that, for that <laughs> little uh, delay. Chris, um, let me tell you all a little bit about uh, Chris and, um, and uh, besides his work for anti-capitalism, for, for artists, uh, what he is, uh, is spearheading, he is a New York born and based uh, theater artist. He works primarily as an actor and he trained at Juilliard, the great Juilliard school and uh, attended the British uh, American Drama Academy. And he went to the legendary LaGuardia High School for the performing arts, the Harlem School for the Arts and other places, of course, that contributed to, to his uh, making of an, of an artist as a young artist. He's a writer, director, producer, and teacher, teaching artist. It's uh, quite uh, impressive what he has done on screen. He has appeared in Spike Lee's She's Gotta Have It, uh, The Resident and Fox, Sneaky Pete on Amazon, The Breaks, VH1, and The Good Fight on CBS, and the upcoming Merry Happy Whatever with Dennis Quaid, also a Netflix uh, production. So in theater, he has worked primarily in new plays at leading cultural institutions like Soho Rep and others. And he won an Obie Award for his performance in Brendan Jacob Jenkins' Nocturoon. Um, and uh, he went on to perform in the critically appraised uh, World Inside a Loop. And uh, of course, we are big uh, fans of Brendan Jacob Jenkins. Actually, the very first reading of the Nocturoon was done um, at the Seagull, uh, Mark Ravenhill and Brandon Matt um, at the Siegel, and uh, we feel uh, close, especially also to that portrait, and of course to to Soho Rap and Sarah Benson, the great Sarah, who also was a prelude curator. Chris, um, where are you now? Um, we, from the background, we cannot really see where you are. So, where are you at the moment? Uh, yeah, I'm hiding out on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, New York City. Oh, good. So, yeah. um, how how has that time of Corona been for you and your work? I mean, that's, whoa, what a way to start. I mean, you know, um, <clears throat> I, it's, there's been a lot of waves of emotion, stifled creativity, abundance of overflowing ideas uh, and everything in between. I, I mean, where I am right now is actually, I feel like I really have uh, a clear game plan for how I want to spend this time uh, while the world is kind of off its center. Um, but I wasn't always this way. I mean, when I started, I came into the pandemic. I remember the first thing all my actor friends around my age were just so antsy. They were trying to start little clubs to read plays together or tape monologues and put them on Instagram. And I kind of instantly was like, you know, guys, I think we're going to be here for a long time. I think, I think it's going to get harder. And I was trying to counsel at least my personal friends rather than try to be like super productive, maybe just take a breath maybe just like see what's actually going on in the world. This is, you know, early pandemic. And then 
I kind of giving myself that permission eventually found myself into certain rhythms that I felt like weren't going to add to the stress and burden of being alive during this really tumultuous time. But that also wasn't me just kind of sitting on my ass despairing because I, I was lucky to have a certain amount of privilege. Um, uh, you know, I'm in my, my mom's apartment right now where I get whenever times get hard, if I, you know, I don't ever have to worry about not um, having a roof above my head in New York City, which is nice. So it's like, well, I'm here, I'm safe. I'm collecting unemployment. What can I do? Right. Um, and, and that's how I found myself to the work that I'm currently doing, primarily around teaching. But uh, but there's some other stuff going on, too. What do you teach? I teach uh, class politics to to artists um, through this organization I've created called Anti-Capitalism for Artists. Um, I devised a eight week curriculum just I mean, I, I want to be clear, I had no previous experience doing this before the pandemic, but uh, I saw an opportunity and I took it and I just kind of assembled all the stuff that I'd read through self-study through the years and put it into an eight week curriculum. And I just put something out on Instagram. I said, hey, anybody want to uh, learn about class politics and capitalism with me? About 40 people said yes. I kind of divided them into four groups of 10, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and just learned as I went teaching these ideas to folks. Um, and I've done it. This is now the fourth, I'm starting the fourth cycle uh, of working with people on next Monday. By the end of it, we will have taught roughly 200 artists of various stripes, uh, the basics of class politics. That's quite impressive. Um, as you know, we are based at the university. So you created a um, a way of learning, of transferring knowledge and, um, and of studying. Um, how did you get that idea? Well, um, when the pandemic started, obviously, I think every American, you know, well, speaking just for America, we all kind of, the relationship to the state shifted, right? There's this virus raging through, decimating lives, killing people, making them sick destabilizing their incomes, um, business sectors shut down, um, despair, et cetera, et cetera, right? Simultaneous to that, um, the streets are coming alive. People are coming alive in protest. There's uprisings everywhere. And, um, you know, I remember I started marching as part of the Black Lives Matter movement when, you know, Trayvon was first mur murdered. And um, I did it for many years thereafter and kind of came to this moment, I think certain, certain people get to at a certain age where they realize there's a certain limitation on protest, not to say that it's ineffective or shouldn't be done, but that in and of itself, um, the action doesn't get you what you want. Raising awareness in and of itself doesn't get you the goal. Plus with the pandemic, you know, kind of flaring me staying at my mom's place, her being of a certain age with underlying conditions, not wanting to go out into the street, catch something and bring it back. I had a couple of reasons where I was like, okay, I might not be a part of this moment in the streets, but how can I still be useful? How can I still contribute to what's going on? And it kind of hit me that specifically as, a, as an actor in, in, in the theater and film and TV industries, there's a lot of discussion about racism, sexism, you know, gender equality, um, even ableism people are talking about accessibility. Um, and it kind of hit me that even though most of those folks who are talking about these things uh, might even call themselves intersectionalists, that class politics, the, the kind of intentional study of our position, not just as identities of, you know, what skin color we have or, or what gender we identify as, but that uniting all of those is a certain class reality. I realize like nobody's talking about that. And it's quite important, right? Um, we, we see that, um, you know, you can elect people who have represent your, your race, um, but they may not actually meaningfully address your, your real material conditions as a member of a larger class of people. Um, and so I said, well, this is an opportunity. Basically, I, I, I said to people, if you care about race, if you care about, um, you know, heteropatriarchy, et cetera, you should also clear, care about class politics. And I'm gonna show you why. So just come over here. And it was kind of just realizing there was this big opening. 
So tell us, class politics, what comes to your mind? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it. Uh, I like to say it's as simple as an analysis for determining who has what and why in political and economic terms, right? So I, I work for a wage, right? But um, most working people who work for a wage after they pay for all their expenses, their rent, their medicine, their food, they're not gonna be able to save whatever they have left and buy Amazon, right? There's an order of magnitude difference between the capitalist class, the business owning class, and the working class of the proletariat, if you want to get old school about it, right? And so it's about making people aware of these class distinctions. You know, Elon Musk didn't just roll over and start SpaceX or Tesla. He actually didn't even, people don't even know he didn't find, he didn't found t Tesla at all, actually. He was at first an em employee who, who wiggled his way into leadership. But even like SpaceX, you know, he got his start in business because his parents owned an emerald mine, I believe it was, in South Africa. What are white people are doing? What are white people are doing owning emerald mines in South Africa? Of course, we have to deal with colonialism. And so there's this legacy of class relations that makes it so that Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos started Amazon with a three hundred dollar, three hundred thousand dollar loan from friends. You know, it's like I don't know about you, I I don't have the friends who could just loan me three hundred thousand dollars. There are certain economic classes that we belong to. Most of us aren't even aware that we are that we're a part of them because there's this myth in this country that anybody who works hard enough can be Jeff Bezos. Well, Jeff Bezos didn't have to work hard to be Jeff Bezos. No, Elon Musk didn't have to. They were born into these kind of classes. And although you can change it, it's incredibly difficult to do so. Um, so, you know, I start by saying to people to explain class politics, my first question is, can you define capitalism? And 95% of the people who show up to this class cannot define the system that dominates our lives. So of course, there's a big problem there. Uh, teaching class politics when people don't even understand the economic system we live in. Mm. And the and the you, the people who come to you are they, they are mostly artists, like of the theater world, performance world, or I mean, they're all artists. Um, I it, you know I don't police that too deeply. I tell people it doesn't matter if you make a lot of money, it doesn't matter if you're famous, it doesn't even matter if you're good. If you identify as an artist, you can be here. Um, but I do allow people to self, you know, some people say, oh, well, you know, I, I um, haven't really done anything in 10 years. And it's like, well, I don't, I don't know how to make that determination. You tell me, are you an artist? Then you can come if not. So I let, I let people sort that out. I would say demographically, it's probably mostly people in the theater, TV and film industry, because it kind of started with my network and it's a lot of word of mouth. But as it's grown, that's really shifting. And, and I don't really know what the exact breakdown i can tell you we've had djs we've had dance makers we've had designers we've had writers we've had creative producers we've had stage managers we've had actors um and we've had of course multi-hyphenates people who do multiple things so you know we try not to make it too uh, prescriptive um because we want to speak to everybody but yeah everybody's welcome mm. And then they pay like in a workshop, like for an acting workshop or like for a directing workshop, you know, they participate in this. I think it is stunning um, at a time where often actors, um, you know, get out the guitar or they sing and make a comedy, comedy uh, uh, a gig and online and to have the flag of the shop out. I'm still here. You said, um, Let's do an academy, basically, eight weeks. Let's think about the system we live in, the capitalist system, how it affects the art. Mm -hmm. um, it's a radical uh, move, um, a move that comes out of corona and corona time. Um, had you always that idea, or do you think it was connected to this moment? I did always have the idea, but this moment made it like... There was no going back, you know, it was like it was an idea that became quite urgent once we entered into these conditions. Um, and I will say, like. I had to change internally before deciding to offer this to other people, like I had to look myself in the mirror and ask myself how serious I take this work um, of centering capitalism and 
you know, embracing class politics and putting that into my analysis. You know, I remember when, again, going back to Trayvon Martin's murder and the emergence of Black Lives Matter, I remember being one of a small group of people in my kind of Facebook network. This is when Facebook was much more popularly used, talking about race, specifically in the theater. I remember calling out, you know, certain theaters for having all white seasons and connecting that to police violence. And I remember feeling really afraid for myself, my career, how's this going to look? I remember I once called out a certain theater that I won't name. And I got an email from the artistic director (laughs) asking me to meet, um, to talk about my critique of them. This is like seven years ago. Um, And I've actually, off of that kind of just proselytizing almost about race in America and specifically in the theater, I got a number of artistic directors, you know, kind of wanted to talk. And I remember feeling, well, is this good? Does it mean, or is it bad? Am I going to be, you know, kind of cast out? Now, what's really interesting is, fast forwarding to now, it's almost too normalized to talk about race. You know, earlier last year, when the pandemic, you know, every theater is putting out a statement. Oh, you know, we see you Black Lives Matter, da, da, da. And I remember most of my Black friends in the theater were like, this is not what we want. We don't need some nonprofit issuing a blanket statement on Instagram telling us they see us. That's like not what... You know, if anything, just do some work and show us. Do you know what I mean? My point is that I felt de- like afraid however many years ago talking publicly about race. And it clearly, you know, the, the culture has shifted. My hope is that um, in doing this, talking about class politics and capitalism, while I am like a little afraid now, <laughs> um, the moment kind of revealed to me that um, this is actually like deeply necessary uh, to be talking about. And, and I, have a, I have a hunch that in a couple of years, we'll be looking back and like all theater institutions will be way more intentionally engaging with how capitalism courses through their institutional veins. Like hopefully they don't let uh, Bank of America underwrite their season or, you know, I dream of a day where Koch brother uh, doesn't get to have naming rights at an arts institution, for instance. These are, you know, kind of obvious things, but it's it's be- beyond even that. I think there's other questions, you know, like the Flea Theater uh, made a lot of news a few months back because of their kind of constant exploitation of their, their resident company. Um, and, you know, this is under the leadership of somebody who ostensibly comes from oppressed backgrounds, like, this is kind of a, a reason, another reason I'm deeply invested in class politics. We, we don't just throw Black people, you know, queer people, whatever, women into oppressive systems and expect them to change. We actually have to deal with the system. Identity is not like a special spice we just sprinkle on top of oppressive uh, systems to make them suddenly function uh, egalitarian uh, in an egalitarian way. So yeah, I'm kind of rambling, but I, I, I do think that the, to answer your question, this moment was really important for, yes, this idea, but also for me saying there's no going back. Class politics is absolutely necessary going forward. Mm-hmm. No, I think it is, it, it is remarkable um, and what you're doing and also um, so much in America, the, the emphasis on the individual, um, you know, do yoga, do meditation, uh, go to the gym, uh, yeah. you know have a better business plan, create an app, and then you're going to be successful as an artist. And often artists even are hold up as models for, you know, the people who are unemployed, uh, who have to juggle five jobs. They go, oh, and then one day you get the Oscar. Yeah. And uh, it's a big lie in a sense. And it's a system I mean, we are all in. And so what you point towards to say, well, it's all about the image, but we're also there is something we move in as Isabel Wilkinson said, you know, the house we live in is 300 years old and the structure of the building, you know, has, mm-hmm. has a race, uh, uh, structure where the windows are, where the doors are, where you look out, a lot of it has been decided and you point towards it. So what did you, what do you study? What did, what do you, what do you read? You, I guess it's based on books or, or do you have improvisations or open talks? How does that, how does a session in your academy, how does it look like? Yeah, and also I just wanted to, I just wanted to say real quick, uh, because I'm not sure, it is free. Everything that I do is donation-based, so I don't charge people 
Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you know, I don't pressure people. I ask once in the beginning and then I ask once at the end and it is what it is. But I will say that people have um, been very generous. You know, if, if, if nobody donated, I probably couldn't justify spending this amount of hours every week when, you know, I might have to figure out another way to, to be productive with my time. But um, yeah, people come through. So that's good. Um, what do I read? I mean, that's the, that's the thing. I'm, I'm a little weird. And I think that anybody who is an organizer or an educator, just like an artist, you know, if you get into these fields, you're a little weird. And it's, it's unfair to expect that other people are going to have the same proclivities as you. So I'm always trying to keep these, these weekly sessions or units, as I call them, engaging. It's a mix of if I can find... Um, a YouTube lecture, or if I can find a podcast, or if I can find a short article, something in really plain language, I try to use as much of that stuff as possible. There are some moments in the curriculum where that's really hard, and I have to just assign chapters of books. I love books. This is my. This is what I'm trying to say. If I had my way, we just would read books endlessly for the eight weeks. What books do you assign? What books do you assign? Well, uh, one, one, one really. Uh, kind of inspiring text uh, we read from is called Inventing the Future uh, by Alex Williams and Nick Cernisek. Um, and it's a proposal for a post-capitalist vision written very much with the now in mind, right? So you can read Marx all day, but, and he's still holds up, right? <laughs> but there's a lot of things he couldn't have seen coming, mm -hmm. like automation, for instance. So in Inventing the Future, instead of the kind of classic Marxist proposal of full employment, um, they suggest that with automation, we might be able to demand, demand full unemployment because we can automate the vast majority of labor. Okay, but in and of itself, this might sound like a hellscape. So of course, there's more things that have to go into this proposal. There's UBI, right? Universal Basic Income, which reading this text, you'll learn up into the past few decades actually had bipartisan support. It actually wasn't a liberal thing or even a left thing. Now it's interesting UBI because you know most Americans associated with Andrew Yang who has a very very fixed kind of capitalist version of it. Hey, I'm in an industry that's going to destroy your job. Here's a little pittance so you like don't starve to death. Not exactly the UBI that we're talking about in a post-capitalist proposal, which would essentially be looking at extracting the surplus value that the automated labor creates and dispersing it equally to people so that they can live fulfilling lives. There's another part of the proposal, diminishment of the work ethic. This goes into something that you were just saying. Part of the drudgery of capitalism is this kind of internal competition, both with yourself and with others. For who, right? You produce all this value, you're, drive, you're you know, driving yourself mad to ultimately give most of the value you produce away. So there's this kind of, and of course, maybe you can bring it all the way back to Protestantism if you want, but there's this deeply enmeshed work, work ethic, which is very toxic and self-defeating, that we actually have to ideologically dismantle so that people even feel comfortable accepting UBI, so they even feel comfortable giving drudgery, you know, kind of uh, banal work away. Now, of course, if people want to do that work, you know, some people really just like cranking a wheel all day, eight hours, it helps them focus and meditate, you know, whatever, then do it, right? But the idea is that in this post-work future, um, we, can, we can automate uh, things the way that people don't want. Um, and you know, diminishment of the work week also proposals that have been around for a long time, a four day work week. I think a lot of us, especially during the pandemic who have been privileged enough to not have to do uh, kind of constant work have probably been working a little less and being like, you know what, I can get the same amount of stuff done with far less time. We all kind of know this, right? Um, so maybe we have to, to rethink a lot of those things. So anyway, it's a, it's a fascinating text. It, it starts with the critique of what the writers call folk politics, which is a lot of like Occupy they were writing directly against, but I would also submit uh, Black Lives Matter. Folk politics as they write about it is kind of, you know, um, mobilization, street protest, spectacle, stuff that really feels good and does have importance, but without sustained, durable, organized, strategic uh, you know, planning um, will ultimately, you know, just be in this cycle. Marches and protests don't renew their own energy. People's feet eventually get tired and they go home, right? So you need this kind of more intentional, um, sometimes hierarchical, you know, these days, a lot of young people are afraid of hierarchy. So, you know, it's very 
decentralized, non-hierarchical, everything's kind of like in its own little orbit. And the writers kind of suggest that we're never going to get, we're never going to build power like that. Capitalism is quite powerful. We need to be a little more intentional. So it starts with that critique. Then there's the proposal. And then the part that I really love talking to artists about is this idea of kind of resurrecting utopian thinking. And um, I think this is something that artists, um, and there's a lot of moments in this curriculum where I, I like to pull out things that I think artists have um, perhaps more facility with than your average person. I think, you know, as artists, obviously the imagination is, is really our stomping grounds and utopian thinking is kind of a critical skill if you're going to commit to transforming the world, particularly capitalism. There's a quote attributed to both Frederick Jameson and Slavoj Žižek that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism, right? And that's kind of sad that that's true, that we could imagine a comet hitting the planet Earth easier than we can people getting together and being like, this exploitative system sucks, let's change it. So I think that this is where utopian thinking comes in. We kind of have to reawaken these, these deeply seated desires uh, Slavoj Žižek says, you know, our dreams are not, they don't happen to us. We're actually responsible for our dreams. And that works in the kind of restaging of our desires. And so for me, that's where study itself comes in. That's where this whole curriculum comes in. In order to change your desires, which is where you're responsible for your dreams, you have to put information into your head and think critically about it. That's never going to happen by itself in this system. The entire ideology of capitalism wants you to just sit back, go to your job, despair, get a check, come home, don't think about it. Blue's in charge, red's in charge. Blue's in charge, red's in charge. And just round and round we go, nothing will ever change, right? So that's, you know, and I, and I think that artists taking this information have two opportunities. One, artists are people. They're workers just like everybody else. So hopefully they can attach themselves to larger working class struggles. But of course, with these ideas in their head, with utopian thinking revitalized, they can create a new kind of art that actually unsettles people, not in the kind of quaint way where they can sit in their seat and like be confused by something on stage and think that that's good, that they're confused. They, they must be too stupid to like, no, like really like get in there, speak people's language, awaken their desire to change the world. It doesn't have to be agitation propaganda. It just has to tell, it just has to show the world as it really is. You know, that's a show a world that's actually, um, that's, that has class relations, you know, that matter and have and that have impact in our lives. So, yeah. Hmm. And you feel that news thinking will also produce new art. So as a polemic question, what's wrong with the art we have now? <laughs> I mean, that's such a, I don't want to get myself into trouble. I don't want to make this personal. Um, if I was going to apply a kind of dialectical materialist uh, analysis of what I think is you know, bad about art. Uh, I'm going to speak specifically about theater um, just so I can be specific here. Um, we worry a little bit too much about the content of the art on stage. This would be my first response, right? Um, it costs $1.5 billion to run for president, not to win, just to run, right? You got to be the kind of person who has access to that kind of money. You can be God's gift to politics. If you don't know the kind of people who are going to give you $1.5 billion, you're never going to have, to have a chance, right, of being president. There are similar class distinctions on who shows up on those stages, right? We know that going to certain uh, institutions, I mean, for me, as a like Juilliard, a lot of people ask me questions about how do you get an agent? I don't know what to tell them because I never had to try. They come, they come to me at Juilliard, you know? But this is, like, this is like a normal question that like any actor, like 90% of actors struggle with. How do I get an agent? Because the institution I attended, I don't even have to worry about it, right? So there, there playwrights, directors, actors, there's an immense amount, amount of class privilege institutionalized before we even see the content of that work. Of course, there's the question of who selects the work that's on stage, their class dimensions here. I know for a fact two Black plays that I've done at white-led institutions got in there almost by flukes. Um, a in both cases, two different theaters, a black woman, either intern or low level position, happened to read the script and like really pitch their bosses on it. And it make that, when I learned that about the plays, both of these plays that I've been in, it made perfect sense because knowing the leadership of these theaters, there's no way 
that those older white people of a certain generation were going to read these plays and understand it, you know, um, like the like the young black woman could. But these were again either low paid or unpaid, uh, you know, internship kind of precarious positions. They're not even the real inst. They they don't represent the institution. I that's why I consider it a fluke. So even you know again the the, the there's so many class dimensions and to determining kind of what stories get told. Okay, we're not even talking about the work yet. Who's in the theater? How much did it cost? We love to talk about ticket prices, right? But I've done plays written by, I, I will name this one, Brandon Jacob Jenkins. I did War, his War, after, uh, after an octave room. We did it at Lincoln Center. Those tickets are very cheap. There's a moment at the end of the play where my character, we're supposed to be at a zoo, and I take pictures of the zoo animals, which really, I look at the fourth wall, it's the audience. Now, I have a real phone in this play, so I decided every night I'm going to take a real picture of the audience. I had this perfect opportunity. But I did that so that I could review the data after the run. And I flipped through all the pictures of every performance, and I saw what is probably about 15 to 20% people of color, you know, roughly 80% white people. And this is at a theater with a Black play, majority Black cast, a Black director, director and very affordable tickets. So... This tells you that pricing is not the answer, right? Because it also assumes that people of color are poor, <laughs> that they can't afford or want to splurge on a ticket of a certain price, right? And it also re it releases the institution of responsibility that it's not just about number on a ticket. It's about who are you messaging? How are you talking to people? Do they see themselves represented in the institution? It's about when, you br when they do come in, what kind of behavioral norms are they expected to adhere to? Dominique Marceau made a really big deal about this at her play, uh, Skeleton Crew, when it was getting, you know, all these great reviews and all these people were coming. You know, Black people were having like natural reactions that Black people have to like Black people on stage and white audience members were like, can you, this is not how we behave in the theater. You know, that's classism, right? It's not, it's not about charging $20 for a ticket. It's about, okay, fine, now they're in the building and you still treat them like outsiders. But even more than this, before we talk about the content of the art, I refuse to believe that the creative team is the consummate labor involved in producing a play. You can't tell me that the play functions without the janitorial staff. You can't tell me that the play functions without the porters. You can't tell me that the play functions without security. This is all labor that is essential for the production of that play in that building. And yet there's these hierarchies that, that express themselves in pay, in status, in relational, uh, you know, interpersonal relations that, that kind of make it seem as though some people are more involved in the production of the play and other people are just, they're just appendages. They're just afterthoughts. They're not really important here, right? So all of this is contributing to a lack of class consciousness in a, in a given theater. But of course, when we now get to the content of the play, there's all kinds of interesting things that happen. Um, I'm of the opinion that to have a truly egalitarian class conscious art, that art needs to be tethered to an actual community, a movement, to people, right? It's not like just reportage all the time where you go like talk to some poor people and, some, and then do a thing on stage where all the actors are kind of middle class, the audience is middle class or upper class, you know, it's like all this kind of stuff. And you're just kind of like copy and pasting and translating into institution. I dream of a day where the people we want to represent in our stories actually take part in the creation and production of, those, of their own stories. That would be quite lovely, right? Um, it means that institutions would have to actually talk to communities, you know, and not claim to speak for them through like fancy word mission statements. They'd actually have to be a way that, you know, the community can actually talk to an artistic director and be represented, not the board of people who sit, you know, run companies or whatever and kind of advise on decisions, right? Um, and then I think we might be a little more critical about the subject matter of, of certain work and, and what it really says. I mean, Hamilton would be an example of a show that people react to seeing all this diversity on stage, right? 
but you can read about people who have been in the, in, in the, in the, in the actual company of the show and they have all kinds of critiques about the hierarchy within the company. Add to all the things I've just said about all this kind of other kind of class-based way of now, uh, analyzing institutional theater. But I mean, you know, we also have to ask ourselves, well, this play, you know, Obama loved it, but so did Dick Cheney. And those, what does that mean when these kind of supposedly polar opposites can come together and say, this is the American story we both agree on? I think there's a level of analysis where we get kind of bamboozled by brown faces in high places women in high places, et cetera, whatever. And I think we can also be a little more critical about, you know, whose stories are being empowered, whose stories are being protected and abetted. And uh, that's a long road. That's a long road, but those are some thoughts. <laughs> I don't know. These are all, um, yeah, very, very question. What does representation really mean? What does the say of that body mean? And what does it stand for? And, um, and um, in Hamilton itself, you know, the way it's produced, and the money it makes is that it's supporting that system. There's the folk spoon in Berlin, for example, where one director, Raymond Polish, was. Well, no, you know, he says, um, how come that we write plays, we criticize this, right, the system, but the way we produce it, but we the director in charge telling who its actor says what, they have no say in it. Um, the way it is produced, the economical model and the artistic model, you know, it's an open contradiction Mm -hmm. He tries to solve it and saying, um, I put out material and actor then choose it, co-write it. There's no main role. Of course, they are subsidized, so it's a different thing. And, um, but um, yeah, why, why is Hamilton not uh, maybe in Brooklyn College, which has a 2000 seat stage, it's often empty and they just do it for kids or high school people who cannot pay the 100, 200, 300, 400 dollar tickets. You know why? Mm -hmm. And it's a great place. It's a great vision he had, but um, yeah, so, um, but it, um, as you say, you know, this time does make us question deeper. Perhaps also you quoted Shizek who said, um, you know, we criticize capitalism, but let's also be honest on the left side, what should it be replaced with? Or is it more modification? Because there is, nobody has found at the moment something that perhaps works better, but the way it's working is not working for everyone well and something is deeply wrong. So my question to you, um, that, that uh, what you earlier said, the, the, the exploitation of labor, um, the uh, estrangement from your work, the, you're no longer connected to your work, your communities. Would you say in a Broadway play, let's say A Lion King, is it also part of a, is it factory work? Uh, do you see parallels when it comes to politics and art? Um. So, sorry, there's a couple of things. I want to make sure I, I get the question. Um, maybe, you know, like, you know, that uh, production model, you ah. know, theaters, um, you know, do you, do you see that as a, um, like a Lion King? I know that for, I think the original actor who played Simba killed himself. Oh, wow. I, did, I didn't know that. Um, and, um, and for what we don't know exactly, of course, money factors put into it, you know, but... Uh, you know, yeah, no, I, I mm -hmm. yeah, no, so there's a campaign happening right now um, with the Actors' Equity Association, our, our theater union for actors and stage managers, um, that there's a, there's a push right now to eliminate the 10 out of 12 rehearsal days, which is what we do uh, from off-Broadway onto Broadway. It, there's this period of time in tech and previews where you're working these 12 hour days. And of course the crew, the production people are working even longer and um, nobody likes it. You know, <laughs> it only benefits, uh, I guess, people who are spending money on the production, but that's a couple of people. The vast majority of people who have to do the work hate it. And so one of the campaigns that started during the pandemic where people kind of sitting around taking stock of their working lives and saying, you know, how can we change it? One concrete thing, you know, we can put some muscle toward is trying to eradicate the 10 out of 12. You know, it's also like um, most unions, uh, one of the things that they got about a hundred years ago was two days off, you know, uh, AEA, you know, is one of the few unions that we have these six day work weeks where we only get a paltry Monday, Monday off. I think there are a lot of conditions in our, in our working lives that in the theater um, that, yeah, they have a kind of factory like uh, 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 spirit to them. Um, 
I, I do want to say I don't think that overall, something you said earlier, like actors having a say, you know, getting to co-write, that doesn't necessarily have to be. I mean, I might not want to write a word. Maybe I just want to show up and say somebody else's words and, and, and be done with it. Like, I don't have to, to feel like um, an owner, uh, to feel ownership, let's say, as a socialist, you know, whatever, to say collective ownership of the means of production. So this play, we all collectivize. We all feel that we own this. It doesn't have to mean I'm necessary. I mean, I think, you know, it just means that my, uh, my opinion, my labor is properly val- evaluated and, and, and compensated. Um, and that I have a kind of democratic say, but that doesn't necessarily have to be in the authorship of words. So I think likewise, the system right now, it's not necessarily about the roles of any individual person, but how little of a say they have in their own working lives. And I think that there's many ways and in, in new models we could, we could look at. I think, you know, kind of the, how you broadly kind of opened this question about, we know this isn't working well, you know, what do we replace it with? I think people often get stuck on that because it's like, well, if we don't have the answer right now, we might as well just keep on going how we're going. You know, part of change is failure. Part of growth is failure, right? You have to try something, see what works and go back to the drawing board and try again. I think a China would be an example, for instance, if we don't know what you're, they, they actually have made a number of innovations in, you know, post Mao to say, how are we going to get to this post-capitalist vision. And they're doing this really weird thing with capitalism right now. They call it socialism with, con- uh, ch- uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, where they're doing things in a different way. Now we'll see, this is an experiment. You know, they, they're very clear. We may fail here, this may be a disaster, but um, that's what they're working with. And of course you have Cuba, you have Vietnam, you have countries that are trying things to, you know, they haven't rid themselves of this system, but they are trying. And I think that in, the, in our industry, um, that's the most important thing is we kind of start from a premise, a theoretical premise that workers ought to have a real democratic say in their working lives. And then the thing is you talk to the workers, you know, you ask them, Hey, what are, what's going on with you? Like how, how's it been? When have you felt beat down, exploited, taken advantage of? When have you felt alienated from your work? When have you felt like you just want to throw the towel in? Why have you felt that? What could we do to change that? One really important thing, for instance, here's a, here's a dream goal, like, in, like what a theater, w- I wish a theater would do. Theaters spend a lot of money into uh, the Equity League, which manages our health insurance. And the way health insurance works in our union is it's basically a Ponzi scheme. You have to work a certain amount of weeks in order to qualify. You may not qualify, but even still your employer paid into the plan, but now somebody else essentially gets that money. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Theaters should recognize if they serve the interests of the workers who make up the majority you know, of their labor force, that single payer healthcare is like, that's a, that's, a, that's, that's a concern of theirs because then they could take that same money that they spent into this like Ponzi scheme of a health plan, health plan give it directly to the actors or stage managers because this is the union they represent. And now, you know, I'm walking away every week with an extra $1,000 in my pocket. That's an extra maybe $4,000 a month. The theater hasn't even had to change its budget, but because we have like single payer healthcare, now I, as as a laborer, am vastly more compensated for my labor and I'm not going to feel as dejected and, you know, uh, exploited um, because I'm actually taking home more of the value that I produce. So this is a way of talking to workers and saying, what's going on in your life? Oh, you're depressed because you don't have health insurance? Hmm, how can I help? Oh, I know. I can align this institution with a national, you know, quest for single payer healthcare and get some more money into your pocket. So it's just a, it's just a way of thinking and talking to people about like what are their needs and how can we help, um, rather than being in these silos, you know, all the time. So um, as a question, we know that leadership is changing at New York Theater Workshop, a great institution, the closest institution perhaps in a way we have to something like the Royal Court um, in London, thinking that the public in a way is kind of a state theater. But um, let's say you would be in charge, someone would pick you, what would you do? What would you do differently? What would be your first things you would do? (laughs) Your discussions of your academy also in four circles, which you did now, what would you do? Wow, Uh, Frank, that's (laughs) that's a question. I mean, I... uh... 
I have no no goals of of uh, running an institution uh, for the foreseeable future, but I I do think um, one of the first things I would do is take our finances and make them a hundred percent transparent. I think it's important that people see how money comes in and how it gets spent. Um, speaking of New York Theater Workshop, I was told that when they did uh, Red Speedo um, a few years back, it costs a lot of money to build a, you know, Olympic sized swimming pool in a theater up to code. Um, I heard something as high as like $100,000. Um, and at the same time, I know, you know, like the wages of what you get paid when you work at New York Theater Workshop. Um, at that time, I think it was something at that time, probably like six fifty a week before taxes, before agent, and before union. So that six fifty becomes something more like four fifty uh, a week, four seventy five maybe. Right? And I just imagine talk about alienation coming into work every day, and you're getting you know you're taking home four hundred seventy five bucks a week in New York City to pay your rent, and yeah. and then you see this object that costs tens of thousands of dollars just staring at you. Um, I know there's some designers right now who are making a campaign to do the same thing. They want pay equity and transparency. I think one of the biggest things we can do is be transparent about money. Be really honest about what's coming in and what's going out. Um, For me, like if I'm doing a kind of DIY artistic project, this is a New York theater workshop, but I tell people how much money we have. So when when I'm paying someone and it's like not enough, at least they know it's, it's not because I'm hoarding it. It's because I don't got it. And then they can decide in, in, with, you know, in good faith whether that's a situation they want to subject themselves to. So I think once making finance is transparent, I think one of the biggest things I do is you know, really try to open up um, the, the building and the ideology of the institution to the surrounding community. This would be a little tricky because that neighborhood is so deeply gentrified that I'd actually be terrified to do that. Um, but I'm sure there'd be a clever way to try to do it so that the people who have been sticking it out there for decades uh, and who aren't coming from you know, the upper crust of society feel represented in that building. They know they have access to it as space, perhaps meeting space, performance space. They know they have access to the institutional resources, the, uh, you know, the intellectual capital of, of, of the people who work there and, um, you know, see themselves represented in, in the work that's produced from the institution. Um, what else? What else would I do? I mean, I'd also, you know, kind of put diversifying staff uh, and, and leadership and, and, and like a very high priority. Um, I would just absolutely, you know, make sure that um, the days of leadership being majority uh, white folks or even majority uh, folks of a certain age kind of is done. There's this piece that I had the honor of actually recording for HowlRound. Um, you know, they do like audio recordings of articles and I, and I cannot pronounce the writer's name, um, but they wrote about their proposal for a public theater in Oh gosh, I'm forgetting the country in like Eastern Europe. Um, but it's this beautiful proposal. I don't know if the article is out yet. Um, for all of the different ways in which they want to make sure that like the community has access to the institution. And basically I would just follow their plan. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of, uh, of the article, but um, yeah, that's, those are some of the things I do. Yeah, maybe that's uh, connected. There was a famous this experiment in Berlin, uh, the Gorky Theater, which is one of the five state theaters, the smallest of them, but still it's on the big street, basically the Fifth Avenue, Winter in Linden, and it had a Turkish German director. And the idea was um, let's have everybody in the ensemble, everybody who works there, every designer, writer, director, with a few exceptions, you know, be of immigrant community, refugees. So basically, Loban looked like me. Um, and they say, do whatever you want, write your own plays. Um, it was, I think, the Green Party uh, proposed it strongly, was able to get it through the political uh, system. And it was a complete 
com complicated start. It took a year, a year and a half, you know, until they got footing. And uh, but slowly they develop plays, road plays, re road plays. You know, they be one day before opening night, unthinkable like in German state theaters or city theaters uh, normally. And after a while, it became the uh, theater with the highest uh, capacity use of seats. Uh, most uh, the youngest audiences, um, it energized a city and it also produced a new work, young work, and people spoke with accents, you know. Um, which was normally a, you are Israeli, Russian immigrant, you are from Lebanon, from Syria, um, you know, you would hear it you would, as you see it on the streets of Berlin. Um, they would subtitle every show into mm -hmm. Turkish. They said, why, well, why do we, they all have to know perfect German. They might not, they might even understand, but they can't follow it like me when I watch it. US, I have to put it on. So there are models yeah. out there. And um, yeah, so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the one thing I'll add, and you know, is like, it, state funding goes a long way toward why some of those things can happen. You know, the, I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend a brief moment talking about the public, which is a, a theater that I've worked at a number of times that I've enjoyed working at, that I enjoy a lot of the work that gets done there. But I'm going to be really honest. Yeah, there's a there's a drift to that institution, right? That, you know, if you've ever been there, you know, that there's a restaurant in the mezzanine level of that yeah. building. But you think, oh, public theater, you know, for public for all, it must be an affordable restaurant. No, it's actually quite unaffordable. I've worked, you know, if you do their public studio, their new play slot, and this always confuses me, new plays get less rehearsal time. It's this bizarre thing. They give you two and a half weeks of rehearsal, previews, actors are still holding their scripts. This is, of course, also where a lot of diversity finds itself. So at the end of the year, they can say they produce this many players of color. Well, they often got this kind of like ghetto, 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 ghettofied uh, slot. Default, less weeks. Exactly. Yeah. And also less play, pay. The contract uh, isn't on the same off-Broadway code as some of the other houses in that same building, even though it's the same theater, same building. So the point is, I leave, you know, let's say a performance or a rehearsal where I'm taking home $375 a week. And, you know, you're leaving, wafting out of this restaurant is delicious, you know, cheeseburgers and steaks. And you think, oh, I'll just pop in for a burger and a beer. And it's like $35. So who is that for? It's not for the artists. They're clearly not paying us enough to eat there. And it's not even for the patrons because uh, a lot of them can't afford it either. One imagines it's for donors and for patrons of a certain income level. Um, it's not just that, it's that it's there, it's the smells, you know, it's really the whole experience, the, 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 you know, the aroma. It's, imagine what that same amount of space could be used for if the workers were uh, thought of. I'm literally just pulling this out of my ass here, sorry if I can't curse. What if that was a mental health clinic for arts workers? I mean, I don't know if you can build if you can build a high end restaurant. I assume you can build whatever you want. What if that was a ment what if they offered free mental health health services for arts workers, right? Um, you know, you already had Jill's Pub next door. That was another thing. Whenever my friends do shows at Jill's Pub, I was, oh god, I got to drop seventy five bucks, you know, to get in there. There's two drink minimum, the ticket. You know, it's exhausting. I want to support you in your the development of your career. Why does that cost more than like? a full production ticket. So there's this logic to the, to the public theater, I think, where, you know, um, it's quite cozy with, you know, banks. Look, this isn't even a leftist point of view. We know that it is literally the banking class which draws this country into every economic crisis. That is not up for debate. And so we have these theaters that we run and we say we want to change the world and help people and, and we like, Meanwhile, we, we take money from the literal people who destroy, you know, who precipitated 2008. Doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I think that, you know, the public is already, there's this interesting deal with the city where it basically pays nothing for rent. You know, it has the kind of Disney plus revenue stream of Hamilton passive income. It has these business, these business ventures. And I'm sure somebody's going to follow up and tell me, Oh, it's not as bad as it looks. I don't, I'm sorry, I, I, I just don't believe it. You know, it's like, how can all, all of this sounds more like the logic of corporate America than it does of something looking for a way out. And um, yeah, I just think that we need to realign our institutional structures 
not with this kind of neoliberal drift into more and more marketization of every single, like literally the art and all the square footage of the building, but how can we align our institutions with the working class within and without of our sectors and industries so that we can, you know, say no more, no more. We don't want this. We're not going to go along with it because that means we can keep the lights on. We're actually going to fight against it. Like that's what we need. Mm. No, it's uh, qu quite striking. Um, yeah, quite striking. Um, 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 discrepancies of what we do and what we think we should be doing, what we're supposed to do, in a way like the great plays of Chekhov, you know, there mm -hmm. people saying great ideas, but what they do, you know, it's completely opposite in their relations and betrayals, you know, on stage and uh, how life it is. And But if we don't do it in the theater world, how can we ask anybody else if we don't uh, see that le level, the system of it? Um, were you part of that Dear White Theater, of that uh, movement, <laughs> of that? Or what do you think of that? I I signed it, but I wrote like a 1,000 word explication of my signing, which to summarize uh, was being very nice that I don't think that this, you know, I, I talked about folk politics earlier. I would consider the spectacle of a, of a letter through an anonymous kind of semi-organized, ah, yes, in the chat, thank you. Zenko Bogdan, I'm probably pronouncing their name wrong, but that article is amazing. Everybody should read it. Thank you for linking that. Um, yeah, I, 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 I kind of critiqued the structure of the movement. I, 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 to this, I mean, I don't know, they kind of had some type of internal crisis over there. They kind of vaguely apologized for something and I, don't, I, I haven't really kept up. This was a few weeks ago, so I don't know what's going on. But, you know, I think that organizations, um, unless you're some type of terrorist organization, I mean, you don't need to be anonymous. You, you actually should stand on your principles and you should draw people into your movement in that way. Um, but also the whole dear white American theater and the we see you. The thing about organizing is when you make demands, you have to have an or else. Uh, that's kind of fundamental. And it's a whole lot of looking, looking at white American theater without necessarily looking at, as my, my dear friend Michael R. Jackson would say, looking in the mirror. <laughs> you know, a lot of people in a certain a lot of the discourse that we see white American theater inspired was a lot of like rightfully dejected black artists and artists of color, but who I, I kind of felt really just wanted a job. Like they weren't really like, I hate the system. They were just like, I want more jobs for people who look like me. And Again, like that's for, for my analysis, that is not the problem. I mean, it, it, it's a short-term thing. People need jobs to eat, but the system is fundamentally flawed. So the movement can't be, you know, put more of us on stage. The movement has to be change how this system operates fundamentally. Uh, and again, I just think the basic organizing principle of it was kind of messy, but you know, you look at the numbers, hundreds of thousands of people sign that letter uh, as far as the online version, the petition goes. But this is the thing. If that was a real organization with hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people that had a or else attached to it, and those people were like deeply committed to being organized, anything could happen, right? If you had 100,000 people in formation, like ready to change the American theater with a clear ideology and a strategy for doing so, anything could happen. But that's not what it was. It was mostly just, you know, this kind of perpetual raising awareness culture. Uh, you know, most people do it, I think, to, to feel good, to feel like they're a part of something. And that's because we don't have, we have this erosion of social institutions. You know, it's kind of this thing of the past that you join, you know, an organization. It doesn't have to be a communist organization. It could just be a group providing food in the community it can be a group providing free medical aid. It can be a group, you know, doing childcare services. We've because of neoliberalization as both an economic system and an ideology, we've outsourced so much of the work that social institutions used to provide into the marketplace, into private enterprise. And so both the institutions themselves and the, mu and the muscle, the skill that we have to develop to know how to be in organized social formations has completely left us. So all we can think to do is tweet a picture 
you know, uh, Instagram a photo, tweet a petition, you know, it's always very individualized, even in anti-racism overall. I mean, the whole language of it. Anti-racism culture today is this kind of cottage industry telling people, if you don't want to be racist, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. It's like this checklist. And most of those things are pretty good ideas, but there's like nothing in the analysis that actually, if you really care about ending racism, you're going to have to be in durable, organized formations that are capable of confronting a system. You don't just get to like not touch a black woman's hair and like racism will go away. It's a system of power that takes an organization of people to confront. So, you know, this is a larger idea that I think was a glaring uh, mistake. And I mean this in a, in a kind of principle point of principled critique, a mistake of dear, dear uh, white American theater. Mm. Yeah, and that signing a petition in, in itself is not activism. It doesn't right away print change, as you pointed out. It shows solidarity as two demonstrations. But I think what you did is say, let us engage, uh, talk. Let's uh, create a curriculum. Let's do a, a new institution of learning, of uh, discovering, of failing. Um, I think there's, it, it, is, it is remarkable um, um, and what you're doing, and it's the very beginning of it. So you talked about, uh, you know, also about new ways of doing theaters, new forms. I mean, the tradition you are from, in a way, is the living theater. It's Amiri Baraka. It's, uh, um, you know, um, that you see a line also. What are new forms? What do you do? What would you like to do? Who do you admire? And decide? What, what do you think works? What, what are <laughs> Yeah, um, there's a there's a there's a, um, a book called The Good Night Out by John McGrath. John McGrath founded the 784 theater companies um, companies because they started he started in England, I believe, and then had one in Scotland. Um, and he was very big that as a proper Marxist, you know, a company should belong to its nation. And so you don't just have this kind of copy and paste, you give each nation. Anyway, it was called the 784 Theater Company. I believe he founded it in, uh, was it the late 70s or early 80s? Because at that time, 7% of the, of the English uh, people had 84% of the wealth. So he, this guy was decades ahead of um, you know, Occupy in, in terms of formulating that. And he worked at the Royal Court Theater in its heyday. And I actually get a lot of my analysis from how he read the room at the Royal Court, which was ostensibly, you know, this place where the working class comes to life on the stage. And it prided itself and branded itself and mythologized itself as this institution that promotes the working class. And he noticed these things of like, well, none of those actors are really working class. If you really think about it, by the time it gets rehearsed to all hell, that's not even really how working class people behave. When who's coming into the theater, how are they behaving? What, you know, they're sitting all prim and proper. They had to pay a certain amount of money. They've got on their Sunday best. They've got the perfume. They've got, they can't laugh too loud. They can't squirm too much. Nothing about this is actually, if anything, it is a place where bourgeoisie and bourgeoisie aspirant people get to pat themselves on the back for engaging in a very sterile way with what they perceive to be the working class. So he had this experience and he left obviously and started his own theater company, but he was stuck. Well then I know, as you were saying earlier, I know what it isn't, what is it? And he realized, well, I just gotta go to actual working class people. So he starts going to pubs. He starts looking into how do actual working class people entertain themselves? And he found, you know, these kind of, I don't remember what they're called. It's some English term, but these kind of places where, you know, you go, you go in the door, there's a pub, there's you know, a bar, people are serving up pints, but maybe there's some wrestling and then they clear the wrestling and then there's a little song and dance number and then they clear that. And it's just, you know, it's, it's wild. And this is what actual working class people at the time were primarily engaged in. But, you know, here's a Marxist that is for, you know, his skill set is theater. So he starts asking, how can I fit myself into this place? So the company ultimately has to start by embracing the, the kind of set and setting that working class people are used to, these environments, which are not controlled, you know, places where people be, you know, police all their behavior and conform to these standards, that has to go out the window. And he said, well, maybe I want to do a play, but instead of hitting people over the head with a two hour play, 
it's we're going to start with a 30 minute play and we're going to start with what they want to see. They want to see some song and dance. We'll do some song and dance. They want to see some pantomime. We'll do some pantomime and we'll warm them up to the idea that we can actually make a theater that's dealing with what's going on in their lives. Now, what's going on in their lives? Alcoholism, because people can't get jobs. Therefore, domestic abuse, because these dejected men, you know, in a kind of proto incel way are taking it out. Uh, heteropatriarchally on their on their spouses, et cetera. So this is not, again, even working class stuff that we associate, you know, generally within the bourgeoisie theater. He's like, what's actually going on in your life? How can I actually put that on stage? And he can, dialectically, as any good, again, Marxist will do, continue to evolve and found that at a certain point, he can make the plays 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, to the point where now he's touring, you know, all the kind of English countryside and people are, you know, sold out. These are sold out tours. Um, of, of plays designed with these people in mind, speaking their language with characters that have, the, you know, their dialects and all this kind of stuff to the point where he has a successful company, right? So it's a whole, I'm, so I'm deeply inspired by John McGrath in this book. It's a series of lectures. Uh, it's very short. I, I deeply recommend it. And I think, you know, we, he was writing decades ago in, in the UK. I think the question, you know, that I have is how, what would that look like um, for me, right? I think um, I'd like to do some mutual aid um, that just happens to have a play going on. You know, maybe we're giving out food. Maybe we have an arrangement we can give out, you know, vaccine shots. Um, people are gathered in an outdoor space. And if they want to stick around and, and see a little show that's dealing with stuff that's going on in their communities, physically in their communities, then great. We can build a rapport with the community from, from there and kind of... Um, you have to work dialectically is the other thing. You can't just come in top down, swoop into a community and like tell people about themselves. You have to build a relationship. You have to go back to the drawing board as you learn. So it's hard to say what kind of forms I want. I think that the forms come from the people. And I think that it starts, you know, fundamentally with talking to people. You know, how, how much do theater institutions actually talk to people? Do you know, like in an actual dialogue, um, inviting people uh, to really open up and let them lead the conversation. So I think forms will become important, particularly I've written my first play. It deals with Maroons. If people generally don't know what Maroons are, they are people, enslaved people who, instead of running to freedom in the North, decided to run, well, it doesn't have to be in North America, to the North, wherever freedom was, whatever free territory, instead of trying to run to the free territory, Maroons are enslaved people who try to make their own freedom in deeply secluded environments like uh, swamps and forests and mountains and stuff like that. Great examples of Maroons historically come out of Jamaica and Brazil, Quilombo in Brazil, and uh, uh, gosh, I forget her name. I think it was a Queen Nanny or, or something in Jamaica. Um, but I'm writing about North American Maroons, which we actually don't have a lot in the historical record about, so I get to kind of imagine. And I basically, early in the pandemic, I had this realization that while I wouldn't mind the play being produced in a formal theater, I want it to be able to work with none of that. I want this text that I'm writing to be just as effective if it were staged in a literal clearing in the woods as it would be effective if it were staged in a theater with sound and lights and props and a set. So that's a turn that I've also had. It's like, I think that our material shouldn't necessarily assume the primacy of bourgeoisie institutions and the literal material structures that we associate with the production of drama. I think that they should be versatile and adaptable uh, texts. So that's my personal answer. And that's also my theoretical kind of inspiration. Mm -hmm. hmm. Wow, well, that's, uh, that's uh, these, are, these are such significant point and you're right. And who does really talk the workers, everybody wants to speak for them. Everybody wants them to buy tickets, but that's not what it's really about, you know? So who really talks, who listens, and what do we do for them? We attack politicians and say they have been, they're no longer interested, and they just see people as voters. We say uh, businesses see people just as com consumers. They don't see them as whole people. And perhaps also in the theater business or film and movies, you know, we, they are just ticket buyers and you compete for them and you, manipulate and massage it so you get the biggest um, biggest audiences and then that's a success so i think we do and have to we uh, reinvent everything question everything miller rouse says and we and you do uh, question um, everything before we go who do you but as artists who do you look up to who inspired you or, or as writers who um who um 
who did you, who formed you, who was important for you? You know, I'm, that's a good question. It's such a mixed bag um, of people. It's a little non-traditional, especially because I'm not going to name a lot of playwrights. But I would say as a writer, um, uh, Raymond Carver is deeply uh, influential to me. Um, excuse me. I think, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for the kind of minimalist prose. But more fundamentally, you know, we're in this moment where people are like, we, you know, we've talked about diversity and representation. And my thing is like, I, I, I'm not saying, you know, I, I'm always like, no, I'll, I'll, I'll read a white writer. I'll watch an all white film. Just please like be really white. You know what I mean? Like some, most of the times when white, white writers write, the, the subject is this kind of neutral character that actually doesn't really have a race. What I loved about Raymond Car Carver, what I love about Raymond Carver's writing is that long before any of these discussions were popularized, I just really felt like when I read his work, I'm learning so much more about kind of Americana and like the kind of myth of, of, of white, white Americanness with such sad specificity, do you know, um, that I love it. it it's, it's instructive just as much as it is good art and good storytelling. Um, and so I'm not interested in writing about those people's lives, but it, you know, for wh whomever I'm going to write about or even portray as an actor, I hope to have that level of like, you know, they're, they're such complex characters that are so clearly uh, entrapped by the material reality of what it means to be an American. And I hope to do that, you know, from my own point of view. Um, Samuel R. Delaney would be another uh, writer, um, uh, particularly his novels. Uh, you know, again, I was reading him as a kid long before these discussions of representation were popularized. Um, before it was even really something on my brain, I've always loved sci-fi, but I think it's very, in retrospect, it's, it's very telling and obvious that I was drawn to the work of a queer black uh, science fiction writer who, you know, was kind of a bit of an outcast and in some ways still is. Um, speaking of black sci-fi writers, I'd say Octavia Butler is a, is a big uh, inspiration. I think what I love about her work is obviously very visionary. She too is dealing with, uh, you know, maybe not like Raymond Carver, but you know, her work is very much set, you know, with America and American ideology as a character, whether it's Kindred, which I don't know if you know this, but Brandon Jacob Jenkins is actually turning into a, 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 a series for, for, I believe, FX or Amazon or something. But, um, you know, in Kindred, if you don't know the story, it's basically a woman um, gets sucked back into antebellum slavery in the present time. She kind of goes back and forth and she learns all kinds of stuff. But but, you know, American history is a character in that story. It's not just a setting, it's a character. But even when she's doing the parable series and she's writing America 50 years in the future, you have climate catastrophe, you have a Trump-like uh, president figure who's kind of galvanized the fascist. These are some of the things I'm, I'm drawn to. I think one of the last things I'll reference off the top of my mind, and this is maybe a bit strange, is the uh, rapper, singer, songwriter, Kid Cudi, um, who, although I'm not a big fan of his, his, his more, more recent work, you know, I, this is a guy who entered into a very kind of mm, hyper-masculine moment in music and chose to be super vulnerable and talk about mental health and addiction and, and uh, sadness and to use a kind of sonic palette that um, was completely his own and very left field. And uh, it's one of those albums, his first mixtape, I listen to it now and I still find myself getting very emotional. And so I'm very inspired by any artist like that who's able to completely cast off um, judgment about what uh you know what art commodities should look like how personal is too personal and just tell their story 100 raw and um and i yeah i hope to bring that as well to anything and everything i make you know, you, you really really do i think it's a uh, astounding your range of engagement uh, your artistic work which is clearly also excellent you know um the ob and all the work you have done but also in your um you know, that vision and that mission and um and to 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 not uh see things how they are but how they could be but also looking 
really how are they and um, it's not misreading them so it's a quite interesting what you're doing and how you stay connected what other way we will do this uh, people sign up for for the academy i think it's a great way to engage uh, to think to learn together uh, in that idea that everybody you know learns um, and, and learns together but focus on something that's important and it is a time to read it is a time to think and it's a time to prepare for when we are back and things have to be different. They need to be different. And um, uh, and uh, what if not, what have all these uh, these people died for in Corona? You know, if we don't um, and take something um, something out of it, uh, we will continue here um, our our Siegel talks this week. Um, tomorrow we have the invisible uh, a dog with us, uh, founder Lucian Zian and Reja Fethakali, a choreographer. They will come and talk about that great institution, um, what they do, uh, how they survive Corona, what their plans are and uh, where they are going. And then we have a great and really a world uh, known Kirill Serebrennikov, a, a Russian uh, director, a film director also, uh, someone who has been banned, was under house arrest, was not allowed to speak. Uh, ran a small, created a small theater, the Gorky Theater, which became one of the best theaters in his country. The theater is very significant. It's been taken away from him in January. He has been slandered with lawsuits um, um, of taking advantage of funding, which is uh, baseless as far as we know. And for human rights was said, there's a great, great artist um, who is also uh, with us, someone like uh, Chris Myers, who believes that we have to take a stand as artists that we have to um, um, show a signal, signal through the flames and, um, and, and um, hint to a possible utopian uh, um, a model there to also engage with the things, how they are. They will not stay the same. Things have changed already, but we don't know where it's going. And art has to play a role. If it doesn't speak now, it doesn't function now, if it doesn't make us now, whenever, and, um, and we have seen this. So theaters, you know, the ones who uh, are part of that industrial model in a way, the Broadway said $5 billion business, they're not functioning. They did not provide for the communities, for the neighborhoods. They did not pay artists. As far as I know, the, uh, there were efforts, but they are co comparatively small to the buildings. Thinking about that, the Lion King itself made $6.2 billion from the Disney Corporation, the largest profit ever done by the company. And that company has theme parks, films for over a hundred years now, almost, um, you know, what have they done to um, uh, uh, continue that outreach and also to create what Chris pointed out, a community um, and to speak to people and listen to them and create something that's meaningful. So but it's a chance where we are now, you are on rock bottom. It's something you can build on, it's firm ground. And I think what you did as one of many initiatives of what artists do, it is, uh, a great, uh, a great adventure. It is important and significant, and uh, and it will lead you something. Also, something will come to you uh, while doing things. So, I uh, really thank you um, for um, for uh, uh, joining uh, with us, and I hope uh, it was also meaningful to you. It was, uh, I think, important to listen to you, really. And uh, I know you have much more to say, but we continue one day and uh, see how maybe we can collaborate with the Seagal Center. To our listeners, thank you for taking the time. And we started last March, as I always say, very few programs were out online. We now have talked to over 150 artists from 60 countries and, um, and we have an overview and there are things are changing, things are happening and it's good to know about it and also to be part of it. Thanks for HowlRound um, to um, uh, be uh, part of it and how important they are is uh, what Chris said, you Senko Bogdan's article, Reimagining Public Theaters as Collectively Organized Cultural Institutions. You can find it on HowlRound. I did not know about it, but um, it just shows how significant these forums are. So thank you. And to our listeners, thanks for taking the time. We need great theater. We need great art. We also need great audiences, audience like you are. So it's a big compliment that you that you listen to us. Bye bye, Chris. And say hi to your mom. And I hope she's doing well. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> in person. So bye bye. Bye bye.